when did it happen? Bible history timeline. So our first slide is when did time begin? Well, we, according to our Bible, time began in the beginning. Genesis chapter 1, verse 1 and 2. In the beginning, God created the heaven and the earth, and the earth was without form and void, and darkness was upon the face of the deep. And the Spirit of God moved upon the face of the waters, and that began the creation process. Now, time began at creation. We don't have any clue what happened prior to creation. We don't have a clue what's going to happen after time is no longer. We just know what we know about time. And frankly, we don't even know when creation was. Uh, the only marker that we have is the seven days of creation and Adam's uh, age at death. Uh, we don't know how long Eden lasted. We have no clue how long Adam and Eve were in Eden before the sin. Uh, we don't know if time, if they started counting years once they experienced the understanding of death in after the original sin, or if they started counting years as soon as they were created. We, we really don't know. And it's would be interesting if we did know, but, but we don't know. Now, when we look at the time markers, we look at creation. Creation, according to the Bible, was created in seven days. Now, there's ideas as to what seven days means. Uh, many people, myself included, consider it to be a 24-hour period. The evening and the morning, the second day. The evening and the morning was the third day. Uh, many people consider it seven eras. And you could actually use the same terminology uh, in describing creation uh, to talk about seven eras. Um, I, I, I have a little bit of uh, unease with it because of a, a couple of minor things that I've talked about when we uh, study creation, but, but that's the way some people believe. And what? how long were those eras? Well, some people say a thousand years. Some people point to evolution and say that that's the, the idea of the eras. Again, I believe in the literal 24-hour day of creation but can i prove it no i can't because all i have to go by is what the bible says and nobody else can prove theirs either because no one but god was around and that's what we have to understand when we start arguing this point some things are not worth arguing over now is it true revelation to where nothing uh, exploded and became something. I can't, I can argue with that all day because I know that God was involved in creation. It didn't just happen. Something, someone caused it to happen. So, so that I can argue with. The process, all I have to go on is the Bible. And the Bible gives very few details as to exactly how things happen. So th those time markers really don't give us a definitive understanding of time. Uh, the other time marker is genealogy. And this is really the first identif identifiable concept that you can find to benchmark time with. And that's the genealogy of and the stated ages of the patriarchs. And that's actually where we're going to go right now. We're going to look at that because there's some incredibly interesting things to be found when you look at uh, the patriarchs and their ages. First of all, we, again, we don't know when day one was for Adam's recorded age. Uh, most people assume that it happened after they were kicked out of the garden. We really don't know. I, I have no opinion and have no desire to argue with anyone over it because it, it, again, it's an irrelevant argument. But we do know that the Bible records his age as 930 years. And we know that at a certain age, uh, Cain and Abel were born, and then we know that later Seth was born. Seth lived 912 years. Now, here's something interesting. Look at the final year of Seth's life. 
1042 from creation. Okay. Look at when Noah was born. 1056. Okay. Enoch, 365 years. Um, now I'm, I'm jumping some some um, generations because it really doesn't have an impact on what I'm teaching here. Methuselah, 969 years. Methuselah was Enoch's son. Okay. He died just before the flood. In fact, legend says that he died one week before the flood, according to the Jewish legend. And that he died because only he and Noah were the righteous ones, and God was not going to have him die with the wicked. Now, um, the problem with that legend is, why didn't he get on the ark? God could have put him on the ark, and he could have lived longer if God would have wanted him to live longer. So, <coughs> so we have to be careful when we, when we grab a hold of legends, but it's an interesting thing to think about. We do know that he died directly before the flood. Uh, because the flood happened immediately after his death. Now, was it one week after his death? We don't know. We have no proof of that beyond this legend. Lamech, his son, dies two years prior to him. Okay. Now, um, this is the Lamech that um, had two wives. Lamech, his son, dies two years prior to his death. The flood happened at year 1656. Again, we're counting from Adam's day one. Okay, so year 1656. Noah lived 950 years. Now, again, Enoch was alive. I'm sorry. Uh, Seth died right before um, Noah was born. Okay, and again, remember that you're not looking at a genealogy, at a genealogy. You're looking at char um, important characters in the genealogy. So there's there's a couple um, genealogies, as you can see in the graph, uh, that are missing from my my line. So if, if we look at the picture, uh, we see that Enos, the the son of Seth, was alive when Noah was born. So, and if you look at Adam, Adam was alive right up until before Noah died. I mean, Noah was born. So all of, there's a huge overlap of the genealogy. People knew each other. This wasn't somebody died and then a hundred years later, everybody forgot about them and they were doing their own thing. Adam was still around. Most of this time, he had impact uh, through this. Seth was still around most of this time. He had impact. Now, again, let's go down to Noah. Noah lived 950 years and he dies. I'm sorry, Seth dies 13 years before Noah was born. My, my notes were mixed up there. I apologize. Shem, Noah's son, Ham, Shem, and Japheth, Shem lived 602 years. Shem outlived Abraham. Shem was alive the entire life of Abraham. Think about that. Many people consider that Shem was the same person as is called Melchizedek, uh, who Abraham pays tithes to. You can't prove it in the Bible, but that's what uh, most historians um considered to be as what is most likely true. But Shem was alive when um, beyond Abraham's life. <coughs> Excuse me. So if we look at Shem's life, uh, date of death, it was 2158. Well, when was Jacob born? 2108. So Shem was alive when Jacob was born. Think about that. Abraham lived 165 years. Abraham was alive the same time as Noah was alive. And he was alive the same time Jacob was alive. So you have a lap here from the time of the flood all the way to the Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. 
Isaac lived 180 years. Jacob only lived 147 years. He told uh, Pharaoh that his days have been short, unlike his father's. And again, Jacob was alive the same time as Seth. They very well may have known each other, especially since most people consider that Melchizedek was Seth and that Abraham knew Melchizedek. Same area. So it's interesting when you see this because you, you can tell that, um, let me give you an example, okay? Let's talk about Shem, okay? You have Shem, Arphaxad, Selah, Arsala, Eber, Peleg, Reu, Serug, Nahor, Terah, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Twelve generations. The most generations that I have known to be alive in my family are four. I have no clue. In fact, I have a sister that tried to do genealogy. And we can't, can't even figure out who was 12 generations back. But Shem knew Jacob. We're not in a vacuum here. There's not things happening that people don't know about. Everyone knows what's going on. That means Shem was alive when Nimrod was alive and building the Tower of Babel. Many people think that that was the great conflict that occurred. Shem and Nimrod butted heads. But, but that's on another topic. But still, all of this was happening when people knew each other. Let's move forward. Let's go into the time of the prophets. Okay. Jonah, Amos, Isaiah, Hosea, Micah. These were all people who lived in roughly the same time period. If you look at, your, at the chart, uh, you can see this. You can see that... Um, Uh, let's see. Jonah lived, or was the time period of the book of Jonah was 20 years prior to Amos. So we're real close together here. Now, Amos died before Micah, but Isaiah, Hosea, and Micah were all alive at the same time. Now, let's put, let's, let's put this in a, a point in history. Okay? Think about this. If you look at your chart, you see that the first recorded Lemic games occurred between the time of Jonah and Amos. The Olympics were in Greece. The traditional founding of Rome was during the lifetime of Isaiah and Hosea. And Homer lived at the same time, you know, wrote the, the Iliad. Homer was alive during this time period. So all of this is happening in the world at the same time. We, we, many times we don't catch that. And if you want to look at the accuracy of the Bible, you one of the things that the scholars do is they compare it to the Iliad. Well, the Iliad uh, is not a lot younger than the Bible. But if you look at multiple translations of the Iliad, there are vast differences in those translations. However, the Bible has stayed true to itself all through the generations and the various languages and translations. That is a great testament of the strength of our Bible. Okay, let's go forward one more um, grouping. Now we see a lot of things happening at the same time. Okay, uh, Nahum, Jeremiah, Zephaniah, uh, Habakkuk, Ezekiel, Daniel, Obadiah. Uh, these, all of these writers and prophets are alive at the same time, roughly. I mean. Zeph Zephaniah died before Habakkuk was born, but, but in the same time period, uh, a time period of about 50 years, all of these are alive. 
And that's why you see the writings that are relatively similar. Now, you do have to, to recognize that um, by this time, the Israel has ceased to exist, and there's only the, the Judah that it remains. But some of these are in exile. Some of these are not in exile. But this is during the Babylonian period. Another interesting thing is if you look down into the timeline, you realize that about the time that Ezekiel dies, both Buddha and Confucius are born. So that gives you, a, again, a pen in history to give you an idea when things are happening. The Roman Republic was formed. It, wasn't no, it was no longer a city-state, but it became a republic. And they began to build the Roman uh, Colossus that became the Roman Empire. Uh, Pericles uh, was alive during this time. Now, what was Pericles known for? Pericles was a Greek. He was the ruler of Athens for a period of time, and he was the one who began to build the Acropolis. Now, if you've ever been to Greece, you would know that that was a huge undertaking and probably well outlasted his lifetime. But the Acropolis was began under the rule of, or the guidance of Pericles. What happened at Apocalypse? Well, when Paul comes around, he goes to Mars Hill and he debates with the philosophers. So this all started, this building of all the temples and monuments started at the time of Pericles. Now, also, you have uh, Zechariah and Haggai that come on the scene during this time period, shortly after Daniel. And now we've moved into the era of when Israel or the Jews went back to Israel and began to build the temple and to uh, restore the city of Jerusalem. And then also uh, after this period of time, the second temple was obviously completed. That's shown on this screen as well. But you see so many time, things in history that are lining up when you look at it this way. We go forward to the next set of prophets. And this time period, you have Esther, which she was not a prophet, but she was a queen. Malachi, Ezra, and Nehemiah all alive. Now, Esther was before these prophets by a few years, at, according to this graph, about 15 years. So um, she was not alive at the same time, but during this time period, she was. We're talking about, again, in about a 50-year time period. Okay, Ezra, the priest sent back by Cyrus to teach the people the law because Cyrus wanted uh, sacrifices in the temple of God to be offered for his, uh, his uh, purpose. He wanted God to be happy with his ruling. So he wanted that temple to be correctly in action. Joel, what do we know about Joel? Joel was the one that prophesied the outpouring of the Holy Ghost. Nehemiah was the cupbearer that became the governor of the province of, that, that included Jerusalem and Israel and um, actually was the one, the catalyst of rebuilding the walls of Jerusalem. So all this is happening. And um, it's, it's interesting when you put things in perspective as to how they are. Now then, let's jump forward. Because remember, from the last book of the Bible being written to, I'm mean, the Old Testament being written to the uh, to John coming on the scene is about 400 years. So we jump forward to the beginning of a new era, the New Testament. John the Baptist was born about, that's what that squiggly line means, it means about 5 BC. Now our calendar is a little bit wonky here, so the date that the years could slide. And in fact, for the rest of this, the years can somewhat slide because of the calendars. 
being changed and everything, but but the um, the cadence of time does not change. Okay, so John the Baptist was born about about six BC. Jesus was born six months later in the year of about five BC. Again, there's about a in this time period. There's about a six six year time period that uh, is a bit of an uncertainty, but about five BC. Saul, who later became Paul, was born in 2 BC. Think about that. Saul watched the life of Christ. In fact, many people consider that Saul could have been on the Sanhedrin. I, my thinking, he was probably a bit young to be on the Sanhedrin, but he would have definitely been there because his teacher, Gamaliel, would have been on the Sanhedrin. And so, all of this is happening at the same time. Okay. Saul didn't just suddenly appear as a full-grown adult. He watched what Jesus did. In the beginning, he chose to be against what Jesus did, but he was he was converted and began to um, preach and teach Christ. Jesus' death, burial, and resurrection, uh, roughly 29 AD. Uh, he his ministry was about three to three and a half years long. We jump forward to the book of Acts, which starts out in Judea and Samaria. Again, Pentecost would have been about 29 AD since his death, burial, and resurrection was at the time. About a year to two years later, Acts chapter 5, we have Ananias and Sapphira choosing to lie to the Holy Ghost and being killed. Shortly after that, uh, 31 to 34 AD, they choose the seven deacons, of which Philip and Stephen were a member of. 34 AD, Stephen is stoned. 35 AD, Philip goes to Samaria. Now think about that. Pentecost, 29 AD. Samaria, 35 AD. Six years before anyone thought about the Samaritans possibly be receiving the Holy Ghost. Even though Jesus went there a couple times in his life and had great success in Samaria. The woman at the well, that occurred in Samaria. But yet, six years transpired before Philip goes to Samaria and people receive the Holy Ghost. Same year, about Paul is converted. But he doesn't start immediately. He goes to Arabia for three years and spends time in prayer and studying the word of God. About 39 AD, Acts chapter 9, Paul comes back to Jerusalem, visit with the apostles for about 15 days, and they send him packing and tell him to go home and wait a while. You need to go mature. Go home. 40 AD, Peter preaches to Cornelius. Now, let, let's think about this, okay? Pentecost, 29 AD. Samaria, 35 AD. Cornelius, 40 AD. Almost 10 years, a little bit over 10 years from Pentecost to the Gentiles receiving the Holy Ghost. Think about that. We look at Acts and we read it, boom, 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 boom. And we think that that's how it happens. Boom, 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 boom. But it didn't. These people had to be shocked by the Holy Ghost. Nobody had an understanding that maybe the Samaritans would receive the Holy Ghost. They're not full Jews. All right, maybe they're half Jews and maybe Jesus loves them anyway, even though they don't really like them, but maybe Jesus does. So, so they decide to go to the place where Jesus had a great meeting with the woman at the well and it also returned another time and did miracles there. 
six years after Pentecost. And still, yeah, but, but the Gentiles, just, just not worth it. Why waste our time with it? God doesn't love them. He only loves the, well, yeah, he loves the Jews and the Samaritans. Uh, we're still working on that one, but, but he did receive, they did receive the Holy Ghost, but not the Gentiles. No, 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 not the Gentiles. About 11 years, finally, Peter has to be shaken in his boots by a vision and a voice from God telling him not to consider something unclean that God has cleansed. And pointedly told, go with the people that are knocking on the door right now to wherever they're from. And he goes, and he still doesn't expect they're shocked when they begin speaking in tongues. Wow, God really does love the Gentiles. I mean, think about that. 11 years. Okay. About two years later, 42 AD, Barnabas goes to get Saul from Tarsus, and then they go to Antioch. Now, they're still working with the Jews. They're not really reaching out to the Gentiles yet. 44 AD, James, the brother of John, one of the sons of thunder, is executed by Herod. Peter's in prison, but an angel frees Peter, and Peter leaves the city after going to the house that's been praying for him, but didn't believe that he would actually be uh, released. Immediately after that, in fact, we know the date on March 16th of 1944, Herod's given a speech. He's called a God. He claims all of the accolades and he dies while everyone's watching and, and his, his body's eaten by worms. So we have a hard date on when this happened. This happened in 44 AD. Uh, we also know that the epistle of James was written about 46 AD. And now this is not James, the brother of John. This is James, the half brother of Jesus. Okay. They finally did come around at the day of Pentecost and, and decide that he really was God. And they received the Holy Ghost. Mary, the mother, received the Holy Ghost also. James, the brother of Jesus, received the Holy Ghost also. And he became a leader in the church. And he wrote his, his letter in at 46 AD. Now then we go into the missions mindset. Finally, God is getting people's attention. At least he's getting Paul and Barnabas' attention. And they begin the first missionary journey. That happens about 46 to 47 AD, as talked about in Acts chapter 13 and 14. Well, they get in trouble because all of these Gentiles are receiving the Holy Ghost. and Everybody wants them to become Jewish proselytes. And they have a big meeting in Jerusalem around 49 to 50 AD. This is talked about Acts 15. Second journey starts immediately after 51 to 54 AD. That's talked about Acts chapter 8, 16 through 18. During this time, Paul writes 1st and 2nd Thessalonians. There's about a year between the two, they assume. But this is, this is the years of 52, 53 AD. Okay. The third missionary journey starts in 54 AD. Paul's not one to, to let grass grow under his feet. He, uh, we don't know who traveled with him. The Bible doesn't state it, but he never traveled alone. So I'm sure someone was there. This is talked about in Acts chapter 18 and chapter 19. During this time, around 56 AD, Paul writes the book, the letter to the Galatians. He also, the following year, and again, there's an, about a one-year gap between 1 Corinthians and 2 Corinthians, but this is the time period that he writes those. 58 AD, he writes his letter to the Romans, telling them he's wanting to come. Okay, And then also that year, Peter writes his first epistle. So now... We are in the time period of Paul in prison. About 58, 59 AD, Paul returns to Jerusalem, causes a great stir in the temple. They want to kill him. 
the Romans save him and put him in prison. And he's transferred to Caesarea and he stays there. While he's in Caesarea, he writes about in the year about 59 AD, he writes Philippians, the letter to the Philippians. Also during this year, Matthew is writing his gospel. AD 60, thereabouts, Paul appears before King Agrippa and gives his memorable sermon. Uh, one of my favorite sermons that he, he speaks, this is where he says, I think myself happy to be in front of you, Agrippa. I choose to be happy, even though he's in prison, he chooses to be happy. And also, this is where he says, you know, Agrippa, I wish you were just like me. Of course, except for these chains. But I wish you were like me, that you would become Christian. Paul sent in about 60 AD to Rome by ship. He has the shipwreck that lands him on uh, Melita. And in 61 AD, thereabouts, he is finally reaches Rome and is put in prison. During this time, he writes his letter to Titus. And he writes his letter about Philemon to his good friend. And I can't think of the guy's name that it was written to, but it's about a slave named Philemon. So, and then also during this time, Mark writes his gospel. The next year, about 62 AD, Paul writes Ephesians and Colossians. And then he's released from prison that year also. And then we move into Paul's last days. First Timothy's written 62 AD. Uh, Hebrews, uh, we don't know who wrote Hebrews. Many people say Saul, some say Apollos. There's other ideas, but it was written about 63 AD. And Luke writes his first, his epistle to Theophilus uh, around 63 to 68 AD. Now, Paul's imprisoned again in 64 to 67 AD. And the, during this time, you have the great fire at Rome. This is where uh, legend says that Nero fiddled while Rome burned. There's no proof that he did, but that's what the saying, the saying is. But this is the great fire that it's talking about. Many people believe that Nero actually set the fire because he wanted to rebuild the city better than it was. But he had a wonderful target to shift blame to, and that was the Christians. Now, what's interesting, I don't know if Paul was imprisoned before the fire or if he was swept up in the imprisoning of the Christians because of the fire. The, the, the history does not say that the Bible certainly doesn't say, but the history does not say that. Peter writes his second epistle, which many people believe that he, that many of the scholars believe that Peter was also in Rome at this time and imprisoned as well. But he, he we don't have any proof of that. And really even the, the, uh, if we look at the, the writings in history, they're, it makes you wonder if they're just putting them there because they want to claim that Peter was the first pope of the Catholic Church. Um, because it's really not, not clear. But we do know that his letter was written about 65 AD. Uh, Second Timothy was written there at that time also. And Jude wrote his very short epistle. Uh, 66 AD, the Jews revolt against Rome. This is when the Maccabees and, and those begin to want to take control and overthrow the Roman rule um, because there's been some desecration of the temple and things like that. Luke wrote Acts around 67 AD. And then Paul was martyred at 68 AD, thereabouts. So that's, that's the last days of Paul, uh, basically his last time being in prison. Um, I chose this picture because as you've seen in the timeline, Paul did most of his writing in prison. He did write some outside of prison, but most of his writing 
was in prison. In fact, the ones that he wrote in other places, he very likely was in prison also. Uh, he, he was uh, beloved by some and hated by many. And that got him in, got him in trouble a lot of times and, and in prison. So, but the picture, I, I wanted to show him writing because that's what he did. He either taught or he wrote. Now, this slide is our, our final slide. And this talks about the end of the beginning. Okay. AD 69, Jerusalem was surrounded and besieged by the general Titus, who would later become the emperor. And his prized possession wound up being destroyed when they overthrew the city because it caught on fire. And in doing this in 70 AD, the prophecy of Christ, when he said, see these stones, not one will be laid on another, was fulfilled. Because when the temple became got on fire, um, the gold melted and went in between the rocks and we're talking tons in weight. They literally pried the rocks apart because they wanted the gold. You see, during the siege of Jerusalem, the soldiers had not been paid for a couple of years. So when they saw the gold melting, their greed kicked in. And that's how, why they destroyed the temple. It was their payment for their services. Around 80 AD, so you got about a 10-year period between uh, the temple being destroyed and John writing both his gospel and his three letters. And then 10 years later, John is on Patmos, or nine years later thereabouts, John is on Patmos, and he writes the revelation of Jesus Christ. And then he dies around 100 AD. So... When you look at the Bible and you look at when things were written, okay, let's look at this. John was the beloved. Matthew writes his 59 AD. Okay. Mark 61 AD. Luke 65 AD. They're 63, 68, somewhere around in there. John waits until the end of his life to write his gospel. You see, he was very specific in writing. He wanted to show the love of God. He wanted to show the deity of God and his love. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son. I mean, that's just John writing. And that was his purpose in writing his, his uh, gospel. He saw what was missing in the factual accounts of the other three writers. And he wrote his gospel, not only from what was missing, because very little of what he writes in his gospel are on the other three, but he also is writing because the thoughts of Plato are beginning to seep into the church. This is where the duality of God is beginning to be attacked. And the uh, concept of there being two gods and not one God begins to be developed. And he said, wait a minute, I'm going to address this. And he does so through his gospel and then again uh, through the revelation uh, of Jesus Christ again that book we look at it as a prophecy book but John did not write it for the purpose of prophecy it certainly has a lot of prophecy in it but that was not his goal he titled this letter and he titled it as the revelation of Jesus Christ why because he had wrote about his love almost 10 years prior 
And now he's writing about the justice of Christ. So when you look at all of this, you notice that there is a lot of things that bring clarity into what's happening. Because you see how that they are uh, lined up. You see how what's happening is being addressed in the Bible. And that's the main reason I wanted to, to have this lesson. I also wanted a light lesson. And I also wanted people to realize the time frames. You know, when you, when you think about how that Shem was still alive when Jacob was born. That puts things in perspective. When you realize that from Pentecost to Cornelius' house was almost 10 years. That puts things in perspective. You understand why some of the things going on. You understand why the council at Jerusalem was such a volatile situation. And it was because that they had a hard time understanding that Jesus really did love other people that were not Jews. I'm so glad he did because that means you and I are able to experience his love, experience what he has to offer.